this is this building is where I taught my first class um, way back in the day. I was a, a doctoral student uh, at Fisher, um, so taught, taught intro accounting in this building. Uh, but been back many many times. I, I I believe in the mission of this college, and I'm happy to to be a small part of what you guys are doing. So um, so thanks. Uh, a, a bit of background. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm in accounting, so I'm an accountant by background. Uh, I teach and do research in nonprofit and government accounting, but realistically, the research is really on, on charities for the most part. Um, and the two kind of areas in the accounting realm that, that I look at uh, are one is the financial reporting of uh, nonprofits generally, but like I said, charities uh, mostly. Um, so on the financial reporting side, what are the consequences, performance measurement, and so on. And then the other side is kind of on the tax, tax incentives of giving to, to nonprofit organizations. And that's the piece that I, I wanted to talk about here. So no mention of 990s, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. Because usually in the accounting audience, people do not want to talk about 990s. Uh, and Stephanie and I were talking about it before. That, I think that's going to change now that there's huge data sets that we can work with and people might be more interested in them. But, um, but no 990 stuff, this is all on the tax side. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about mostly about one paper uh, and then talk about a new idea that we're working on that relates to it but it all revolved around uh, government incent tax incentives for charitable giving that are based on market values of the things that are being given uh, and some of the consequences of those that maybe aren't fully appreciated uh, like I said mostly will be about an old paper but I also want to talk about a new paper time permitting uh, so Okay, so the paper, um, which is co-authored with Anil Arya, who's uh, also at Ohio State, um, is about the economic consequences of enhanced tax deduction for charitable donations. And so what we're talking about specifically here is deductions for corporations. Uh, I mean, mostly C-Corps, but we can talk about some of the uh, logistics if you want to talk about <laughs> some other types that when and what, uh, under what circumstances those come into play. Um, but, uh, oh, we said, thank you. Um, but so companies who donate uh, to uh, charities and the tax incentives that they are given in particular for their inventory. So uh, here's kind of a, a background. This is a most recent uh, look at the top 12 corporate donors. Um, I put a little asterisk next to those uh, that are of relevance to this particular question. I had to look this one up. This is uh, Gilead Pharmaceuticals. but. Um, so six of these 12 have something in common, and the thing they have in common is their tax breaks they get from, from donating to charity uh, comes to the form of they're donating inventory, they're not donating cash. And you'll also notice five of those six are pharmaceutical companies. So um, the story might largely be about pharmaceuticals, but it's not entirely because Walmart and, and there's other smaller players in this that are donating inventory. So um, what we want to talk about, I guess, first of all, is why is this the case? Why are these donors uh, at the top of the list? And why are they donating a lot of inventory? Um, and what are some of the consequences of that? So here's the background, I guess. Uh, unlike an individual, so if I had some t-shirts that I wanted to donate, I can give them to Goodwill, and I can get a tax deduction for doing so. And so there's some uh, inherent tax incentives for me giving inventory. Um, it's not inventory for sale, but things that I happen to have. Uh, and it presumably is for fair market value of the item that I've donated. Uh, a company, if a company has shirts that they don't sell, there's really no inherent tax benefit for them giving it. If they donate it uh, and they get a tax deduction based on the cost of the item, uh, the, the tax break is really equal to the tax rate times whatever the cost of that item was. Or they could just burn the item and it would be a cost of doing business, and it would be a similar tax break. And so kind of all else equal, there's really no tax incentive for giving inventory, or there was no tax incentive for giving inventory. So this changed in sometime in the 70s when Congress came in and said, okay, we're gonna try to encourage charitable giving, and uh, Section 173 created this enhanced deduction for inventory donation. So for a company that has inventory for sale that they choose to donate, they can get an enhanced deduction for having done so. And the particular here is that instead of getting to reduce their taxable income by the cost of that item, they can reduce their taxable income by the midpoint between the cost and the price of the item. Uh, well, 
technically, it's capped at twice cost. Uh, and that would be not marginal cost, but full cost. So there's all kinds of stuff you have to deal with there. But the basic point is that suddenly, in order to incentivize giving and mandatory, Congress decided that uh, we could make a tax deduction that's tied to the value of the item being sold or donated, not the cost of it. And as you might guess, suddenly there's, a, there's an incentive to give stuff. If it's not going to sell, I can donate it. So at the end of the day, Panera has stuff that's uneaten, they can donate it. Walmart, uh, it's the country's largest grocery store, uh, they donate unsold items that are about to be uh, past their expiration date. Or, I mean, I think Congress has actually come in and made some more specific rules about how far past expiration date is acceptable and so on. Uh, but all else equal, instead of just throwing away the items, I have an incentive as a, as a corporation to now donate them because I get an extra tax deduction based on the price, not the cost of the item. Uh, and this has been a successful approach to try to encourage giving by corporations. There's now more than $5 billion in annual inventory donations by corporations. Um, but the, inter the interest we have here is kind of considering what are some of the side effects of this, this particular policy. So, um, yes, as an individual, if I have a shirt that I'm not going to use, I can donate, get a tax deduction, no problem. If I'm a company, now I need to suddenly think about if I have a shirt which is not selling, I can donate it and get an extra benefit. And that's sort of the uh, thinking, I believe, of Congress when this was uh, adopted. But it is definitely a... Um, uh, partial equilibrium thinking because once we start providing that incentive uh, behavior changes so and the behavior changing isn't just I'm going to start donating items it's that suddenly I'm going to start thinking about how I work with these items so that's the, the basic question we're interested in um, a preview of the results in case you guys don't want me to get into the details uh, okay so the first is kind of an obvious statement uh, which we don't really prove because it's uh, already there, corporations have an incentive to give inventory instead of cash. So if I have cash and I donate $10, I get a $10 tax deduction for it. If I have, you take that $10 to make a shirt which <coughs> sells for 20, I get a $15 tax deduction. So I immediately would turn the cash into inventory and then, sell, then donate the inventory. So all else equal, what's happening is that uh, corporations have an incentive to give inventory instead of cash, or even use the cash to make inventory and then donate it which seems not what charities want. Charities would rather have cash than inventory, for the most part. Um, so that, that part, like I said, that part I think is well known. The consequences of it, perhaps not. Um, but here's some of the results that we kind of uh, derived in our model was to say, okay, now if we take that one step further, corporations are going to have incentives to give their inventory. What are the consequences of that? Well, one is they give inventory and, and charities get the inventory. That all seems good. Uh, but if my t tax deduction is now tied to the price of the item that I'm donating, I, the corporation, have a stronger incentive to ensure that the prices are pretty high for those things that I'm donating. And so I have an incentive to raise retail prices for the things which I'm donating. Um, the other piece that we look at, though, is to say, well, that's one of the markets I deal with. I deal with the retail market. But what about kind of moving upstream, and that is the wholesaler input market? How does that affect? the way input providers view me, if some of my items are being donated instead of sold. Uh, okay, so those are kind of the basic results. Thoughts, questions before I get into the model? Yes? Quick question. So, is there a specific about how they calculate the price? So, I think about groceries companies that as the expiration date approaches, they cut the price. Do they, is it the final price or is it the average price or is it the original price? Um, okay. maybe, maybe that that is a good implementation question. I don't know if we have a uh, clear answer to how companies are doing this. So definitely in the grocery, you would say, um, if I have items that are almost expired, this is the price that I sell them for, but I'm not gonna be able to sell them for that price now. Um, I think largely though, that retail price can, can hold up. Uh, the bigger controversy here is on the pharmaceutical side, I would say, and this is, this is also from the standpoint of charities receiving them and listing them as gifts in kind. Uh, what is the value of pharmaceuticals that are donated that are then sent overseas in a more, uh, you know, is it the wholesale price of those? Is it the retail price in our domestic market? Is it the retail price if there exists one in the foreign market? I don't think we have uh, great answers to that uh, other than I think using the full retail price of pharmaceuticals in the U.S. is probably not gonna work. Uh, 
but you'll hit that two, co two times cost cap anyway, so it's not as pertinent there. So it's a good question, and one I don't know if there's kind of clear across the board consistency. Oh yeah, question over here. Uh, similar question. This is so. Is it is it normalized at all? Like, if one company is selling a similar pharmaceutical for like twice the price, are they going to get it? Like, it, would the return be higher for them, even though they're similar products? So okay, so we have two pharmaceutical companies that are selling exchangeable, somewhat exchangeable items, and you're saying their retail prices are very different. Yeah. Are they then going to get different tax deductions? Yes. Uh, conceivably, so. Um, this, this, there, there's a big open question as to what you can record that market value as. Uh, to the extent that we've seen some enforcement, I think it's more on the charity recipient side what they record the fair market value as. Um, and you see huge variable. I know lots of charities have had to uh, restate their financials based on using pretty large assessments of value uh, for items that really weren't worth that in the in the country in which they were used. Um, so but I'm not I'm not aware of that <coughs> actually hitting an enforcement. But I think that's largely driven by the fact that this, you know, the tax deduction is the midpoint between cost and price. And the the wedge with pharmaceuticals between cost and price is really large. Um, so even if you use full cost instead of marginal cost, probably that two times cost is gonna kick in at some point. And I just don't, I, I don't know, data wise, yeah, because it's all gonna show up on company, corporate tax returns, we don't have that data. So I, don't, I, I can't say for sure how they've chosen to implement it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so a few things which we don't model, which we do think are probably important to this picture, and we've played around with this some, but we, we don't have any results on that yet, is, so one piece of this is, let's say I make inventory with the intention of donating it. And you might put pharmaceuticals in that category. Uh, they can just produce some extra and then donate it. It's not, it's not they're donating stuff that they weren't able to sell. Uh, you probably put Walmart in the category of, they have some stuff that they weren't able to sell, and then they go ahead, well, as long as we can't sell it, we'll donate it. And so this notion of uncertainty about consumer demand, we haven't incorporated, but this seems like an important part of the picture that um, it's essentially some protection for companies that say, I'm not sure how much demand there's gonna be, but I'm more concerned about running out of product than I am of having leftovers, because leftovers, I'm kind of protected, I can donate them. Uh, and we have glaring examples of that playing out in the one around the Super Bowl every year, people highlight, which is uh, they make t-shirts for the winning, for both teams, and then they donate the losing team's shirts. There are some tax incentives for doing so. And so that downside risk of, well, one of the teams won't win, what are we gonna do with all that? They can donate it and they get a tax benefit for it. And that gets back to, back to your question, what is the losing team's shirt worth? <laughs> um, that's an open question. I think they largely claim it's worth, well, we have this other product, which is very similar, and it sells, uh, and it's the uh, winning team shirt. Um, so, but don't, you know, those are some implementation questions about this that I think are important. And we don't have that. So what we do have um, is, uh, is parsimonious and economic models we could, we could go with, I think. Um, and the goal is just to try to say what are the economic incentives of the corporations involved in uh, transactions like this. And um, what are the consequences? And so we start with kind of like I said, the most basic model we can think of, standard uh, demand for a product, so downward sloping linear demand. So for a given number of quantities, this is the retail price, or we'll just have the firm be a monopolist, so it can also <laughs> set price and we get the same thing. So price versus quantity doesn't really matter. We can talk about what the consequences are, especially since it's already been brought up, of what happens if we're not a monopolist, but there's competition in this market, and so on. Uh, but starting with the simplest thing we can start with, which is there's uh, downward sloping demand for the product. The more product I make available to consumers, the lower the market price is going to be. Um, the thing we've added is that in addition to selling quantities on the retail market, I can donate the units of whatever the thing is. and. Uh, I have this enhanced deduction. Uh, based on D units, I get S, S, I'm calling it the, the tax subsidy for donating. Uh, and it's tied to the difference between V, which is the cost of the item to me, and P, which is the retail price. 
Uh, this is a simple way of doing a more complicated thing, well, more complicated <laughs> to us at least. I shouldn't say that, tax, I, we should, as accountants, we should be able to tax it better than I am here, but um, writing out profit net of taxes, and then saying, oh, by the way, there's this extra tax deduction uh, based on the midpoint of price and cost. Uh, and that would be this re reflection. So beta is the relative weight you put on price, retail price and cost of the item donated uh, for the tax deduction, and T is the tax rate, uh, then you, what you get is S is this. So it's, it's a simplification of the, the basic notion that if uh, legislators want to put a little extra incentive on donating inventory, it would show up here. So beta equals zero would be the case of the tax deduction you get is cost basis. Beta equal one would be the case where the tax deduction is the price of the item you donated. Uh, and beta half is current law, uh, with the exception of that cap. Uh, so beta half would be current law, and then tau would be the, the marginal tax rate for uh, that company. Okay, so that we can kind of capture everything we want about what's the effect of this enhanced deduction by looking at what's the size of S on this market. Uh, we added this extra feature, which isn't necessary to our results, but we, we want to take into account that companies give for reasons other than taxes. Uh, they might donate inventory because it helps with their brand. Uh, and so we just have this warm glow notion of if, I get, if I'm Panera and I donate uh, to food banks, people look more highly upon Panera and they might be willing to pay more for products there, or at least in comparing to competitors, they might be more interested in Panera. Um, so this is a, you know, a well-known explanation for why uh, companies give. And so we want to incorporate something to reflect that, this omega. This is omega, isn't it? No. It, okay. It's been a long time since I've done the uh, symbols here. Um, so we, just to capture that there are other reasons for donating inventory that we haven't kind of uh, detailed here. It's not just about taxes, but taxes are part of it. And so that's the piece we want to look at. Uh, so we've, we've incorporated this other possibility. You get an extra benefit for donating. The cost of the inputs to me, the firm, is V, which has to be less than the maximum willingness to pay for consumers. Otherwise, I wouldn't, wouldn't even be in business. And then we have this conversion and processing cost to get some interior solutions on things. Uh, so some quadratic costs of, of producing or selling or donating or transferring items. All that kind of leads to a firm profit expression, which this is this would be kind of the normal thing we see. Uh, this is the retail revenues. These are the co retail costs. And here's the cost of the items that I donated. And here's the shipment and other costs. Here's the tax benefit for giving. And then here's the other benefits for giving. So with that kind of firm profit, so it's kind of funny to start with. The story here is about taxes, and we haven't. Uh, we're doing just firm profit, not net profit net of taxes. But um, firm profit net of taxes would be 1 minus T times all of this, where you would plug in this for S. So it's just kind of a simple indication. Taxes are there. So this would be the firm profit. And the question is, in this circumstance, what quantities and what donations would a firm choose? Again, there's no uncertainty about how much consumer demand there will be. Uh, if we want to get somewhere, we probably want to incorporate that relatively quickly. But we don't have that yet. Um, OK, thoughts about the model before I proceed? Yes? So I, I'm not all that familiar with pharmaceuticals, but I'm assuming that some of those firms are doing value, they're, they're producing things, right? Which is different than like Walmart, which isn't producing value added. And so, of course, I look at the war and glow, and I'm like, well, if you go to Feeding America, the first business that pops up is Walmart. So it helped me, that helps me a little bit understand maybe the differences, because those other five, like the difference between Walmart and, and their non-value added, I think is a different set of or it's a different level of incentive. Yeah, so there's a variety of things, and you know, we can talk about the different how those different parameters would show up when we think about implementation of the idea of different uh, things. But you're right. So Walmart would be very different from those, in part because it is it's much more about the input pricing circumstance. They're they're essentially buying inputs and then just selling them. And so this would be kind of the cost of transporting them and so on. And so this might be more critical to them than this piece. Uh, whereas, like you said, with pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, there are some input prices to them, but this is probably not particularly important. What's important to them is the value that they add to the items that they have. 
Um, so I think we can kind of reflect those in a rough way, but only roughly. I mean, I guess the other piece, uh, you know, I saw this, there was a piece out, um, I forget what publication, but uh, a news article last week about the fashion industry and how they're throwing away so much clothes. And so the other piece we don't have here uh, today, which pharmaceuticals are probably a little bit concerned about as well, is if I donate the items, are they going to find themselves uh, undercutting my retail market? And so we don't have that modeled either. Um, and that's, that, I, I'm, I'm going a long way by <laughs> addressing your question, which is that's not particularly big concern for Walmart when they donate salad that's about to expire, that the salad will find its way on a gray market. Um, uh, Pharmaceuticals might be more concerned about that, and we don't have that model either, and that would probably be a big factor for them. Yeah. Do, with, um, to qualify for a tax exemption, is, are there rules about where you donate? Like, like Goodwill takes items that receive and kind of sell them back, but then food banks give freely. Like, there's just different gradations of, of what the charities do. Okay, does yes. That affect? Good point. So it has to be given to a domestic charity and there's restrictions on it has to be for uh, the indigent. It's for it's food, clothing, medical. Um, over the years, it's currently it's in the permanent tax code now. It used to be a tax extender, and so each year there'd be different categories that were put in there, like books for education were acceptable, um, computer equipment for education was acceptable at least one year. Uh, as of now, it's um, it's food, clothing, medical, and it has to be domestic to a domestic charity. That doesn't mean the domestic charity can't use it overseas, uh, but it has to be a domestic charity that's, uh, and I forget the exact wording, but th it couldn't be just resold by that charity. Um, so that should provide some protection that it's not gonna, it's not gonna find its way back on the market. Um, but yeah, so there's some of those restrictions. There's you know, actual restrictions on it. If it's food, here's how acceptable, here's how, what, here's what we mean by edible food. It has to be edible and so on. So, um, so there's some extra restrictions on, on that stuff too, and that should provide some protection. Um, yeah, okay so, okay, so that's the basic model. Uh, with this model, again, what we want to identify is what, you know, what are some of the economic consequences of having this extra incentive? We know the, all else equal, the extra incentive is gonna get more donations, but what other consequences would it have for these markets? Um, okay, so. This is not particularly informative, <laughs> but I'll put it up there. Um, here's what the equilibrium would be. I mean, I say equilibrium because one firm at this point, it's facing tax incentives, so it's not really, any, it's just what, what does that firm do? What are the quantities Q and donations D that the firm is gonna choose? Um, but it gets, you can see why we look at one firm. It gets kind of messy really quick. Uh, but it's pretty intuitive. If, if the tax subsidy is small, that is, you know, tax rates are really low, and or this, uh, this added enhanced deduction is not too far away from cost, then you're just not gonna donate anything. Uh, and everything would look like a standard monopolist outcome. And so the standard monopoly profits and so on here. Uh, this, again, it excludes the notion of there's other reasons to donate. Uh, and so what this S hat kind of captures, what is the relative incentive? And you can really think of it as S hat plus this omega. So the tax incentive plus other incentives for giving need to be big enough for you to give. That seems, I don't think we need a model to make that point. But at least it's looking like something we would have uh, expected to see. Uh, in which case, if the tax incentives, or we just say if the incentives to give in general are large enough, then you give. And what we're interested in is in those circumstances when firms have incentives to give, what does that do to the markets in which they operate? So here's the amount of the donation. Here's the quantity you put on the retail market. You can quickly convert that to price, which is what we'll do, the big focus here. Um, so these are the outcomes, this, the D and Q, and the question is what, are the, what do those mean? And so the basic things they mean, I so the first is kind of an obvious statement. There's more tax incentive for giving leads to more giving. So all else equal, if I'm either facing higher tax rates or the government of uh, puts a higher tax enhanced deduction for giving. I'll give more. Uh, that was kind of the idea, and it plays out here, but I don't think that would be a big surprise. Uh, the piece we really want to focus on is that kind of the, the perhaps unintended consequences are that retail consumers suddenly are charged a premium. If 
the tax subsidy is at or below the amount for which uh, firms would donate inventory, you have a much lower retail price than what happens in equilibrium. So once we've given that extra incentive to donate, you've also created an incentive for higher retail prices. Uh, or another way to look at it, incentives for scarcity. Uh, the firm wants to make less items available to the general public because that results in higher prices, which gives us a higher tax deduction. Now this is all at the margin. I don't think we're gonna be making the claim that uh, Walmart's gonna stop stocking their shelves because they wanna get the tax deduction. But at the margin, this extra tax deduction is gonna have some influences on their prices. And that's kind of the point that uh, we wanted to make, um, you know, among some other things that I'll talk about. That's kind of the main thing we get out of this is that if Congress wants pharmaceutical companies to donate more, uh, it's going to have this side effect of pharmaceutical consumers paying more. <coughs> uh, and that side effect is something we would want to take into account. And uh, perhaps I'm jumping ahead, but it's an uh, abstract enough model that we don't have to apply it just to donations and inventory. Uh, Real estate companies that put conservation easements, uh, similar sort of thing, that creates some scarcity. The deduction I get for the conservation e easement is based on the fair value of the item or the land that I put the easement on. And I suddenly have an incentive to have really valuable land uh, that I want to put an easement on. And so similar sort of story here that once you create those incentives that say if you put a conservation easement on land, I, the firm, or the donor, it doesn't have to be a firm, the donor would um, suddenly have incentives for that land to be worth more, or at least the easement to be worth more. Um, okay, so that's one point. I guess the related thing is that the greater tax incentives you provide for giving, uh, the higher the retail prices for the items that are being donated. And so you can kind of get this strange wedge of, you know, absent, don't, absent incentives for giving, you might have an item that has a pretty moderate retail price. Once the government puts big tax incentives for donating inventory, you suddenly have a wedge. You have a lot of items that are being given for free and a lot of items that are being given at a high premium. And then the question is, is that something that we want? Obviously, this is the piece that most people are thinking about, but there are these other consequences. And it's a strange, it's a strange form of third degree price discrimination in that it, we're price discriminating at consumer level. Uh, either you get free items or you get really expensive items. Uh, and that's something we kind of want to be thinking about when we talk about the policy implications. Um, oh, okay, so this was kind of the last piece. Uh, we kind of do welfare calculations. Uh, it's, it's hard to think about overall welfare here, um, but the welfare comparisons, and I, I didn't put them here, it's a little bit messy, but the welfare comparisons really look at if you add as a policymaker, if we add this enhanced deduction for donations, you get more donations. And there's a benefit of uh, corporations being more charitable. And that is, uh, that's kind of the unmodeled piece. What are those benefits? We haven't necessarily uh, modeled what are explicitly, what are the benefits of redistributing some of these resources. Uh, but if presumably there are some benefits to taking food and inventory. And so this is the increased welfare effect is that it makes items which consumers might not be able to pay for available for consumers uh, indirectly through charities. Uh, the downside though is that amongst those who are retail consumers, their prices are going up. And that's the downside is kind of the offsetting piece. And if one wants to think about uh, policy implications, it really has to be taking into account those offsetting factors. And so I think uh, pharmaceuticals are a big area of question, but there's others, others too. And, and Congress is, like I said, from time to time has brought different types of items which count towards this enhanced deduction. I'm not sure what has brought some in and brought others out, but these seem to be the questions that we'd want to ask. And if I go back to the Walmart example, um, I'm not particularly concerned about Walmart suddenly raising the prices of salad uh, because of donations. It doesn't seem a particularly compelling story. It's probably very small at the margin, but this is not something that's really entered into the public policy discussions about these things. Whereas other things like pharmaceuticals, I might be more concerned about those prices being raised. And it, it comes back to the question, which we haven't modeled yet, but I'll talk about shortly, which is here we presume that the firm that's selling the item, it can just set prices. They're not a price taker. Uh, what if they are a price taker? I mean, I guess Walmart's not exactly a price taker, but much more so than a pharmaceutical company that has a, a patent protection. And so those might be important distinctions too. If you are facing a market 
for which you can't really influence the price, then this downside isn't so big uh, and the upside's still there. So these are things that I think our model would have in terms of implications. Um, I thought I saw a question now. Oh, yeah. Talk about patents. So I mean, the other type of price discrimination is when a patent expires in the generics. Mm -hmm. The difference between the, the non generic and the generic version. I assume you get much bigger because the, the cost is the same, but it's a bigger price margin. Yeah, so um, that's a good point, and I, I think, and I didn't, I don't think on these particular slides I went through this, but we did add this notion of what if there's essentially additional competition at the retail level, and maybe generics would be, this would be a way of incorporating generics that suddenly I'm facing much more retail competition, and suddenly it's not so straightforward for me to increase the price, or I might be much more concerned with retail competition than I am with donating, and so I think some of our results there are. Added retail competition makes you much less likely to donate and try to incorporate the higher prices. Much more likely to focus on the retail market. I um, think that could apply somewhat there, like once that patent protection disappears, um, you know, the, this story becomes much less compelling relative to the, the retail, retail market pressures, but um, it might not perfectly match with that. Yeah? Um, so. If you change your retail prices, but your cost didn't change, would you only, theoretically, if you were the firm, raise your retail price to a point that's just above that like double cost point, so you would get the additional incentive? Yeah, that's a good point. Happen? So uh, in this particular model, we just presumed it wasn't capped at twice cost. Okay. Um, so I can't answer it <laughs> in this particular model. Okay. But we have played around with that some um, in adjusting the model to say, what if it comes at that? Cap. Now you're right. Once you're at that cap, um, the added incentive for a high retail price is zero, and so you're you essentially have a your your preference function suddenly cap caps much like the uh, the tax benefit would. And so depending on the parameters, yeah, you might hit that cap. In which case, the tax incentives go up, and it doesn't really change your behavior anymore because you're already at the cap. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We've played around with it. It's not in this particular version, but um, your point is is well taken. I think it does come into play. The other piece, which not to get too accounting on you here, the other piece is what is cost? Um, because if you especially think at the, at the pharmaceutical level, their marginal cost is really, really small. Um, but for the most part, uh, IRS permitted uh, use of things like activity-based costing, which is going to incorporate a lot of the fixed costs. Um, and so there can be some allocation of fixed costs that make it work. It's a little bit more compelling than saying our marginal cost is zero. If the marginal cost is zero, the tax deduction would be twice of zero, so there's no point in doing this exercise. But kind of how big can you, how big can that get in the in the context of a cost allocation question is out there. We don't model it here, but um, it's of interest to cost accountants. Uh, but that might be the only people interested in it. I'm a cost accountant. I could say that, um, <laughs> but it, it has an effect. I mean, it does have an effect on the tax benefit. Um, okay. Uh, other were there other thoughts? Um, Okay, so the other piece we looked at, though, was to say, okay, we what, we've, what we essentially modeled here is a firm that miraculously has products that it then sells, and we've just said, there's the cost of making the products, which is V per unit, and so on. Uh, and we've noticed that once you add those tax deductions for donating inventory, it affects the retail market. And the next, at least in our mind, the next natural question would be, what effect does that have on other markets, and particularly the input market? This might be more pertinent to firms that rely on input markets as opposed to add their own value to pretty standard inputs. But um, so start with the extreme case of a monopolist supplier. So instead of just having this V be, be uh, constant, exogenously given is what's the, what's the effect if the input that we use, that we ultimately sell, is procured from somebody else. And that somebody else knows we may take the item they give to us, but they don't give it, <laughs> the item we buy from them, and we may sell it or we may donate it what effect does it have on the relationship I have upstream? Uh, and so we did this with the monopolist supplier who's just setting the prices, input prices, uh, in and of itself not particularly realistic, but at least it uh, lets us kind of highlight at the extreme case where I'm beholden to an input supplier who's providing these inputs to me, what consequences are going to have on our relationship. Uh, so the first piece, uh, which kind of flips this, flips the previous story, which was retail prices are higher due to the tax incentives uh, for giving. Retail prices are lower, uh, sorry, uh, wholesale prices are lower due to the tax incentives of giving. 
And the underlying idea here is that if I'm a, an input buyer and I'm taking those items and selling them on the retail market, the input seller is essentially incorporating my willingness to pay, my marginal willingness to pay for additional inputs when it's determining the input price. Uh, effectively slope, take, facing a downward sloping uh, demand curve at the wholesale level. The fact that I have incentives to give and I will give changes that demand curve. And it makes it where some of my units are being sold at a high retail price and some of my units are being donated for zero. I'm getting a tax benefit, but the amount of money I'm getting from the donated units is definitely less than the amount of money I'm getting from the retail units that I'm selling. And the input provider to me cannot stipulate, I will sell you these inputs and here's how you have to use them. Uh, they will just sell inputs to me at a particular input price. And they are aware that I'm selling in two different markets, one of which is very profitable, one of which is not. And so their input price is going to reflect kind of the average profitability of those two markets. And so the more that I donate, the less profitable my overall uh, input purchases are uh, per unit, on a per unit basis. They're less profitable. Uh, so I'm more price sensitive. As an input buyer, I'm more price sensitive because I know some of my units are being donated. And that greater price sensitivity forces the hand of the input provider and makes them essentially sell things to me at a discount. Uh, and so that's this, this result. The uh, input price, when uh, this tax subsidy is large enough that I donate, is less than the input price when I don't donate. Uh, on the other hand, the higher the tax subsidy, the smaller that wedge is. And there you can think about it as the input price reflects the average profitability of units that are sold. One, is, one market is ones in which they're sold and one is markets in which they're donated. And the input price kind of reflects the average of those things. As the tax subsidy goes up, this donated market becomes more valuable to me, the, re the retailer. And because it's more valuable, they can charge higher input. So tax subsidies create this circumstance where input prices are lower, but greater tax subsidies shrink that uh, that fact. Um, and so that's, that is uh, this result. I think perhaps to us at least the more important result to highlight though, is that despite the fact that tax incentives for donating inventory may lower input prices, they still result in higher output prices. So that retailer price effect that we identified that at the start is of first order importance and the input price effect is really of second order importance. Um, yeah, so that's this piece, that the retail price when you donate is higher than the retail price when you don't, despite the fact you're getting lower wholesale prices. And that wedge increases with the tax subsidy. So despite the fact the tax sub subsidy can kind of have this uh, unintended silver lining to it in terms of efficiency along the supply chain, that unintended silver lining is really of second order importance to this notion of consumers are being uh, charged more. Um, so then when you do welfare comparisons, you have to take into account all those sorts of things. Uh, input prices go down, which uh, can ease concerns along the supply chain. It can allow you to send more units down the supply chain. Uh, you also send more to uh, charities. That's also a, a welfare upside. Uh, the welfare downside would be that retail consumers are suddenly paying more for items than they would have if there weren't so many donated items. And again, so those are the things that, you know, we don't have any uh, prescriptive answers here, but the things that policymakers should be considering when, when addressing these policy questions. Um, so those are like, the main results uh, to the model. A couple things to note. I think I mentioned this. Uh, there are other donations that are made that are tied to markets. Uh, that could have similar implications. So one being conservation easements, the deduction being tied to market value. Suddenly, um, there's a, kind of this joint incentive of donating some things and making sure that the land that's tied to those things that are donated is worth more. And so that, that's also been in the news uh, with um, golf courses uh, being a conservation easement and the homes around them suddenly are worth a lot more. And a developer, it's in a developer's best interest to take advantage of those things. And we've seen developers, well-known developers, the President of the United States being one, um, 
we took advantage of those opportunities. Um, and so suddenly, hey, if I had land which is worth more, then the tax deduction I get from donating the conservation easement is worth more too. And so these things are, I think the policies are all developed around, we would love to provide incentives to donate things, but the question is what are some of the side effects of that when it's tied to the value? And so another one which I know much less about would be recycling credits for, um, for items being sent back for recycling. Uh, some of those are tied to the market value of the items. Uh, and it might have similar consequences, again, kind of raising the retail uh, prices of those things which are being donated. So the overall theme here, uh, from my perspective, would be that there are side effects to markets once we start tying tax incentives to those markets, uh, and inventory is one of particular interest. Uh, so that's the basic idea of this paper. I'm, I have time, I can talk about another one, but I'm happy to talk about this <coughs> some more. Uh, thoughts? Comments on this? Yes. Well, this is about the welfare part of it. So, have you done any uh, thinking about how we, uh, like, uh, what the utility is of the donated items to those who consume them and things of that sort? Um, we've we've definitely thought about that. We haven't really modeled it beyond a very rudimentary kind of like there are some benefits to society of the donations, and we'll just model those.